Okay, so welcome to the panel session on spectrum sharing issues and approaches. Uh, my name is Keith Gremlin. I'll be the moderator for this session. I am the, uh, currently the director of the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences, or ITS, which is the research and engineering branch of NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Um, it's relevant because in 2012, the NTIA was tasked by the president to identify 500 megahertz of federal spectrum that could be transferred and sold to the private sector. And ITS is responsible for doing a lot of the measurements and analyses uh, to help enable spectrum sharing in those bands. So we've set up a, what I think is a very interesting panel, and depending upon your point of view, it's the best from all sides of the argument or the worst. Um, so let me introduce the panelists one by one here. So immediately to my left is Paul Anaskevich. He is CTIA's Vice President for Spectrum Planning. In that job, he's responsible for technology and technical matters concerning spectrum advocacy, spectrum allocation for network evolution of 5G and other technical areas. He's got over 28 years of technology planning, network engineering, and operational experience. Now, prior to CTA, Mr. Anaskevich was CEO of Cat and McGuire, which is a wireless technology consulting firm responsible for developing technology strategy, implementing operational change, and for sourcing billions in infrastructure and devices for a wide variety of U.S. and international clients. Mr. Anaskevich also served as CTO and VP of network operations for two U.S.-based cellular operators and has served as a board member of PCIA for Microwave Clearinghouse and has worked with international governments on many regulatory and spectrum auction issues. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from California State University and an MBA from the University of Dallas, and is a registered professional engineer and holder of several technology patents. Next to him is Derek Klopin. Derek Klopin advises the Assistant Secretary and NTIA Administrator principally on matters involving spectrum policy and management. Additionally, Mr. Klopin acts as the liaison between NTIA's Office of the Assistant Secretary, it's the Office of Spectrum Management, and my Institute for Telecommunication Sciences. Prior to NTIA, Mr. Klopin most recently led the North American Government Affairs activities for Nokia Solutions and Networks, where he represented the company in the U.S. before Congress, the FCC, the Executive Branch, and other government agencies, as well as industry forums. Previously, he was the Director of Regulatory and Industry Affairs for Nokia. Mr. Klopin also headed the regulatory and legal advocacy efforts of the Telecommunications Industry Association and its information and communications technology member companies. Now, Derek started his career as an attorney in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau of the FCC. He's held leadership positions in industry associations, including chairing the Government Affairs Council of the Consumer Technology Association, serving as co-chair of the Federal Communications Bar Association's Wireless Practice Committee, he has a JD from the Columbus School of Law at Catholic University of America with a certification from its Institute for Communications Law Studies. Next to him is Julius Knapp. Julie is chief of the FCC's Office of Engineering and Technology. He's been with the FCC for 42 years. He became chief of OET in 2006. He previously served as a deputy chief of OET. Prior to that, he was chief of the Policy and Rules Division where he was responsible for FCC frequency allocation proceedings and for proceedings amending the FCC rules for unlicensed radio frequency devices. He was chief of the FCC laboratory from 94 to 97, where he was responsible for the equipment authorization program and technical analyses. Uh, Mr. Knapp received a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the City College of New York in 1974. He's received the FCC's silver and gold medal awards for distinguished service in 2013, he received the Presidential Distinguished Rank Award for Exceptional Achievement in the SES Service of the United States of America. Next is Preston Marshall. Uh, Dr. Preston Marshall is the Engineering Director at Alphabet, cool, Google's parent company. He's been active in spe spectrum sharing since starting the DARPA program and was involved in the PCAST study while at USC and is now at Google leading its implementation of the first three-tier band. In addition, he's the chair of the Wind Forum Committee developing industry standards for this band and is a founding board member of the CBRS Alliance, which is working to commercialize TDE LTE in the band. He's the author of several academic books on, con on cognitive radio and one on the subject, 
three-tier shared spectrum, shared infrastructure, and a path to 5G from Cambridge University. This will be released early next year. And finally, on the end, is Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor is the Deputy Director for Policy, Technology, and Operations for the Spectrum Policy and International Engagement Directorate within the Department of Defense Chief Information Officer. In this position, he's responsible for transforming DOD's capabilities in electromagnetic spectrum use in order to ensure technology development can meet the department's ever-increasing demand for spectrum and improve DOD EMS operations. His responsibilities include oversight of the DOD EMS strategy, development of the strategy's roadmap and action plan, the development of the DOD EMS technology roadmap, and overseeing the Spectrum Access R&D program in coordination with the National Spectrum Consortium. Tom has worked in e electromagnetic spectrum policy and management for over 17 years, including 10 years at the DOD CIO. His EMS experience includes an assignment to NATO headquarters in Belgium. He was a division chief at United States European Command with responsibility for EMS management and development of the initial requirements for the Global Electromagnetic Spectrum Information System, or GEMSYS, initial capabilities document. He also developed the prototype for the joint Coalition Joint Spectrum Management Planning Tool. Prior to his EMS work, Tom served 22 years in the U.S. Navy in various leadership positions, flying S-3B Vikings. His awards include the Defense Superior Service Medal, Defense Meritorious Service Medal, and several other personal and unit awards. So to run this, the uh, panel, what I'm going to do is, is start with a question and ask one of the panelists to take three to five minutes to respond, at which point I'll open the floor to the other panelists for rebuttal, uh, emphasis, or whatever they choose to speak on. Try to keep each question to about 15 minutes, then leave us time to ask some questions in the end. Okay, so... With that getting started, <clears throat> commercial entities are, of course, clamoring for more spectrum. The president made a commitment to free up the 500 megahertz by 2020, as I said, and 630 megahertz of federal spectrum by 2024. Many of these bands have incumbent military systems as well as other federal systems, some of which are being moved to time over other frequencies, while many of these bands are designated for sharing. So I'm going to toss this question out to Tom Taylor. Uh, why should the military support spectrum share? Is it to avoid reallocation? Are there benefits that the military are likely to accrue? And should sharing be bidirectional? And if so, how? So kind of a big question, but over to you, Tom. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, the, the warm introduction. I, I didn't realize that I could sound that good. I know when I wrote it up, <laughs> it clearly wasn't that good. Another thing I didn't expect was uh, I have a new best friend today. So my new best friend today is Mr. Bill Lacker. He's the deputy CIO, uh, or chief of staff of the G6 of the Army. And he said something in the plenary session this morning, which uh, really caught my attention because it's something we've been on the Army about for a number of years. And I never, I, I didn't really, I didn't really understand that they got it. And he said, spectrum maneuverability. So I'm going to leave you with spectrum maneuverability and then back back out of the question a little bit and, and kind of give a little scene setting. They talked in the plenary about the last 15 years of military operations. I'm going to say we need to go back to the last 25 years because over the last 25 years, we have been on an open battlefield. We've been studied. We've been assessed. We've been invested against. And one of the Achilles heels that's been clearly identified is our commitment and dedication to using the electromagnetic spectrum. Our capital investment in the electromagnetic spectrum has been very fixed and very regulatorily influenced over the years. That has created a weakness, a weakness that we have to address as we evolve, sharing nationally is part of that evolution. Why? Because with effective sharing, and I'm going to talk about bi-directional sharing, we can use that to improve our readiness and training. How can we do that? We can improve our readiness and training by having more spectrum. We currently limit 
some of our training and some of our more uh, larger training ranges simply because we can't get enough electromagnetic spectrum to do all the training we need to do for the modern battlefield. It can help reduce the cost of our ability to our cost in developing new equipment now because right now we're spectrum constrained on our test rings. If we can use bi-directional sharing to get more to get access to more spectrum when we need our more robust testing and the development of equipment, we can reduce the time to develop that equipment. And that in turn saves us money. It also helps from the national scheme because it helps us build a stronger economy. As many of you know, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines win battles. But see, it's economies that win war. So what's good for the nation is also good for the Department of Defense. So when we talk about spectrum sharing, there's many pluses. Why would we want to constrain a resource that we're losing 10 to 15% of at any given point in time and not enable that resource to be shared so that we can increase the overall utilization of that. It does not come without great challenges. And we need to address those challenges, and I think we're gonna get to it as, as, we, as we move forward with this panel. But sharing, bi-directional sharing, yes, there's great opportunity there. It helps move us to equipment that can be more maneuverable on the battlefield as we increase the tuning ranges, leveraging new technologies to get us out of this fixed frequency reservation-based mindset to a capability which can outmaneuver an enemy which is invested against us to shut down our capabilities, which from a mission perspective, we are 100% dependent upon in order to execute and succeed on the modern battlefield. Thank you. Anybody? Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. Preston? I think one other advantage to DOD is unique bands you can share. Let's face it, now, I spent 30 years building military concrete, now I'm on the other side. But, um, you know, for 30 years, we could never compete with a cell phone. Let's be honest. How many stories did we get out of Iraq about people using commercial gear because the middle gear didn't do what they needed done? Um, by having stuff now that's in the mill band, so in a couple of years, in this first experiment, we're going to have LTE equipment native in a band where DOD has the primary allocation. There's an opportunity for the first time now for the military to make use of the two to three year technology cycle. So I think it's not just the spectrum issue, it's now you've actually created a marketplace which may not be so good for traditional military suppliers, but for the system integrators and all, you're now going to see an opportunity to buy equipment that is in a military van that could be adapted to military use that would never be available if the civil didn't have an interest in deploying large markets in that event. So I do think uh, there's a, a strong advantage in creating an ecosystem that both sides can access. So, I frame it in the context of what I think this is really all about, and that is that uh, it's not just that the private sector cell phone groups are growing and so forth, but they're growing on the military side, they're growing across government. And so, what we've been trying to do all along, develop tools that enable us to get more out of the spectrum on an ongoing basis. It's not getting any easier. So. I haven't been at this for a while. If you look back, for example, coming out of the budget acts in the early 90s, it was all about reallocations. And uh, it wasn't only from the federal side who were reallocating microwave band bands for things like the second generation of wireless phones. And it was we had places to relocate the existing systems to. There, were other, there was enough space elsewhere that we could come up with a plan and say those microwave point systems could be moved higher up in this country. Uh, I would say from a Canadian government's point of view, it's, from Minnesota's point of view, it's always preferred, preferred to have exclusive spectrum. Uh, we continue to try to create those opportunities. But the places to relocate things are getting harder and harder to find. And 
So we have to find a way to accommodate both of these. And I'll just give you a little bit of an example. One of the things that came out of that, uh, the budget accident in the 90s was reallocation of 50 megahertz of spectrum, which we found in the radios. And so it was clear by shifting the Navy radar down, <laughs> so it's reallocated. Uh, a little bit of pain, but it was worth it. So when we were trying to find more spectrum here in the 3.5 band, uh, the uh, NPIA working with the agencies have identified 100 megahertz below, still used by the Navy radar, but there's no place to put them, and we still need them. So that really, along with the evolution of our new sharing techniques, uh, drew us all to the conclusion that everybody can do it. If we can develop sharing techniques that provide certainty for newcomers but still protect the existing systems. And, and so that's why we're so heavily invested in trying to do sharing work. Not as an end to itself, but rather a way that we can create win win scenarios for both the military and the federal agencies, as well as the private sector, and squeeze more juice out of the public sector. Hi, and uh, thank you, thank you, for the opportunity here today. So, and NTI, yeah, just as, as, a, as a little um, background for those who aren't familiar, and chat team a lot with FCC, and NTIA within the Department of Commerce manages the federal use of spectrum, and it's um, you know, in, in its entirety. And we, Certainly work with DOD and the other agencies. Um, you know, NTIA is a decision maker, but in collaboration with the agencies, so we have a very active what we call the public the policy plan steering group, EPSG, and uh, certainly we've been focused on spectrum sharing and, and repurposing for a long time. I think most everything has been said. The, the other thing I might would point out, really, again, here is the is the opportunity, and, and I think what's exciting are some of the, the more uh, greenfield approaches as well. Too, a lot of sharing has been around. Protecting incumbent uses and how you how you fit these in the existing framework, um, but some of the more recent things around the, the millimeter wave bands, I think, open up a new opportunity where we have, in, in general, spectrum that's less used today, and I think those opportunities going forward that set sharing and how how we may do that at the ground level, um, and, and you know, I think collaboratively, creatively on, on how we do that. For example, in the 37 gigahertz band. We have 600 megahertz that's set aside there that we're, we have co-primary uh, designations for, for federal and non-federal. And I think a real opportunity to, to think in the future on how we how we put that into use, particularly when you think of the uh, technology up there and the, the propagation characteristics where you, you know, spectrum doesn't propagate as far. The uses are going to be very different. You may have, you know, be able to actually share, uh, you know, a lot closer geographically than you would in other bands. So I think that's an exciting opportunity. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, for this audience, CTIA is a trade association. We represent the Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 cellular carriers and also the manufacturers on the commercial side. So, as Preston said, there's a couple of things that we can do and we've been participating in this uh, both as a trade association but also as a leader in looking at how we could use the spectrum that Julie and Derek have made available with Tom's help at 3.5. And then how do we make that experiment work? We've come from the traditional world of exclusive use spectrum. Um, we've worked with Julie over the years in terms of rebanding uh, different folks and reallocating spectrum. But I think we're all now to the point that we clearly understand that there's not a lot of those choices to go around. So then how do we mature this technology? Uh, because in our case, our industry is growing by leaps and bounds. Most of you have at least one smart device in your pocket, if not two. Um, I carry, I carry two in my pocket. So, and the usage on all of those devices is going nuts. And as you see, what's happening in our industry, um, where media is coming together with cellular carriers, which is coming together with content, which is coming together in a lot of different ways, and all of you are using it different ways. But at the same time, like Tom talked about early in his remarks, uh, the warfighter needs a particular uh, set of needs. Those needs are growing, their data needs are growing, so we're gonna have to figure out a way to share. So we brought our industry to the forefront to say, okay, how do we work with DOD? How do we work with NTIA? How do we work with the FCC to come up with the right compromise over time? Thank you. Thank you. Any go-backs? No, all right.
let's move on to the next question then. So in some sense, sharing has been with us a long time. I mean, we've done geographic sharing between television and radio stations for ages, but now it's becoming more dynamic and uh, bands are available for sharing as long as a federal incumbent is not actively using the frequencies. So for example, in the 3.5 gigahertz band, uh, in the uh, new entries are required to be able to sense federal systems and change frequencies to avoid interference. So sharing opens up opportunities, but potential issues as well. So I want to toss this one out to Derek. So what are the potential pitfalls of spectrum sharing, uh, both technical, practical, policy? How do we mitigate them? For example, what happens if consumers start complaining to Congress that their access to spectrum is being harmed by the military? Uh, what happens if the military can't get access when it needs it because somebody's not playing by the rules? So sure, I can, I can kick this off, but I, I have a feeling that everyone here is going to have some pretty good things to say. Um, I mean, look, without question, use of spectrum has always involved some level of risk, right? But by the definition, you know, the public airwaves are, generally speaking, are shared. Uh, you know, again, the legacy rules are mostly about staying in your lanes, you know, avoiding causing interference. Um, you know, but on, on the federal side, I, I will point out that, you know, sharing in particular on the federal side, and federal and non-federal as well, sharing is, is not a new concept. And, you know, we, we deal with it on a, on a regular basis. And some bands will have 15 to 20, you know, agencies or systems, um, you know, across agencies, whether it's DOD and others, who, who share it today, and we have to manage that. Um, so, you know, going forward, obviously you need, as, as you get a more congested environment through sharing, you need clear rules, you need clear expectations, you, you need to know what those rules are, engagement are. Um, but the 3.5 gigahertz band that you know we're talking about here a lot today, and I think we will continue to, um, it's certainly not that you know the FCC adopted the decision and, and immediately everyone's able to go out there and just start playing in the sandbox, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of work being done, you know, behind the scenes to get the rules in place so we can get to a point where there is enough certainty that people will not just invest but actually deploy the new systems, and conversely that you know the, the military radars will. Be protected there so there's there's confidence on both sides and getting those systems in place and you know it's a it's a tremendous process that's on that's underway right now um, you know there will be cases of course where enforcement is necessary i think in the long run and, and i no longer the fcc we've had a lot of these conversations is how do we get to an environment where enforcement is, is much more automated um, you know again the fcc and ati will step in where we need to but you know perfect scenario when you have um, authorized users out there, the, the, the goal is to have, let's say there's an interference event, that you're able to detect it and work it out amongst the parties before you have to go to a regulator. You know, human intervention is part of it, but ultimately I think the devices are getting smarter, the systems are getting smarter, they can resolve these issues themselves, whether it's moving on to another channel or the like. Um, but a lot of work needs to be done there for sure. You know, in the bad actor case, obviously it's a little bit different. And, you know, we're going to continue to have to deal with those situations where you may actually have to shut systems off. Um, another issue in this area, I think, are, are preemption levels. So clearly, I think we've, we've heard, you know, a lot of times, particularly with military or national security systems, that we don't always need the spectrum. Maybe we need 10% of the time, but when we need it, we, you know, we really need it. So we are going to have to have rules in place that say, okay, let's, let's figure out how we make that work. But, you know, in my view on that, I think we've gone a long way from where in the past it may have been, you know, we need to protect that band from sharing or from making it available because we need access when we need it. Um, again, knowing there's 10% use as opposed to, um, you know, now being able to say, okay, we can, we can come up with mechanisms that, you know, we're more open to making that available when we're not using it, but we need to have those systems in place. We need to have enforcement mechanisms. And I think that's a, that's a mind shift that, that's, that really has taken hold. Um, you know, again, we, I think it was 2012 when, you know, after the PCAST report, um, you know, the lingo became, you know, sharing is the new norm. And I think the expectation is that we know that there is going to be sharing. And, and again, on the, even on the commercial side, sometimes if you, you get a band where you know someone may preempt you, you know, 10% of the time, it may become a business decision where we'll, we'd still rather have that band 90% of the time than not have access to it at all. So again, it's going to be different in each case, uh, but but I but I think I think there are scenarios that we, we can work uh, to improve the situation. Who wants to respond to that first, Preston? So, so I think we should 
it's true that we're, we're introducing new risks in sharing, and, and 3.5 is certainly the poster child. But one of the things that went in 3.5 was the experience of two prior attempts, uh, the TV white space and uh, DFS. Um, there was an ISAR a couple of years ago, for those who go to ISAR, um, which was essentially three days of horror stories of chasing down DFS issues. Uh, Julie nods, yeah. Um, and and that, that is really baked into a lot of the stuff that went into PCAST and then into 3.5. Um, DOD supported PCAST and it didn't come readily. Um, I don't think anyone in DOD is, um, who is involved in that is around now, but, but we essentially had to go through these were the issues that, that couldn't be solved in fast sharing, like how do you chase people down? How do you know who's there? And so the latest regime picked up, I think, and, and essentially solved. Those, whatever those issues were, they won't happen again. We know everyone is in the band. We went from unlicensed to licensed by rule. We have the ability to shut people off if there's interference, which we didn't have in DFS. So it's, it's not that we're just adding risk each time we share a ban, we also have to recognize that we're learning and creating a lot more assurance. When I worked in DOD, if I wanted 10 channels, I had to go out and get 13 because three of them would have someone improperly in them anyway. So that was about a 70 percent, 30% error rate. Um, I think we're going to be much, much better in these sharing regimes than we were in the old ones because we've added all these recourses. So, so each time we do this, we learn how to do it better. Uh, I think it's easy to say we've expanded the risk surface, but we've also learned how to, to get rid of those risks. So everything that went wrong with DFS, if we did this right, should never be able to recur. We'll find some new things, but, but we're also closing out the big ones. And so we're getting 80%, and then we're getting 80% of the remaining 20, and hopefully the next spin we'll get 80% of whatever we miss this time. So I think Preston's right, and I think one of the things that Julie, yes, Preston, I said that, and I said that in front of Julie, uh, Preston and I sometimes are at odds in the other panel. Yes, and by the way, Julie, this is the third time in a row that we've been together that yes. Preston and I are agreeing on some things, but because uh, normally... That's how many times. You have to understand that CTIA opposed everything we were proposing initially, so this is a new warming. So... So, and, and that's true. We're trying to embrace the technology. We're trying to participate in the process and work with Julie and, and Derek to put the right regulatory framework together. Our carriers want to invest. We traditionally invest billions of dollars in the spectrum to start with. We invest another billion or two dollars to relocate people if necessary. And then we spend, you know, we bring a couple billion dollars and some people think, uh, if you see what's out there today, that we'll invest about 1.7 trillion dollars to actually make uh, 5G work and deploy. So with that, we need the right f regulatory framework because you can imagine those are large investment decisions that are with publicly traded companies, which means they have stockholders. So the net of that is we've appreciated the openness both at DOD and FCC and NTIA that we can sit down and work about what didn't work in white space, for example, what did work, uh, what what are the needs that Tom and the, the, the DOD community need and we, we all sit down at the table very often now to try to work this framework out so again, we can foster investment. But also, there's a lot of companies now that are involved in this wind forum that Preston and I spend a lot of time on because we're trying to build the right standards and framework together at the same time with the regulatory framework at the same time in cooperation with Tom, which is very different than what we've done in the past. Keith? Julie, did you want to? make this interactive. How many of you heard about the stories about the garage door openers? Show of hands. So a good share of the audience. But a lot of you haven't. So let me just say a few words about it. And because it often colors the way people think about sharing. So we've had unlicensed devices, including garage door openers, and then you realize that uh, the key fobs on your, well, from your cars have been in uh, the roughly uh, 225 to 400 megahertz band. Parts of that band were quiet in large parts of the country, and it was a nice place for garage door openers to deploy. <laughs> They've been there for years. So, not too long after 9 11, the military was uh, increasing security at the bases and deploying new trunked land mobile systems. And around the bases, when the new land mobile systems started to go in, there were complaints about the garage door openers are not. Either they weren't working or their range was reduced. Nobody's door was going up. 
that was a different issue from maybe 35, 40 years ago. Um, so we, what we did, we brought everybody together in the room because the unlicensed uh, devices are not protected. And I think we, we on our side at the commission stood up to that. We issued public notice, said you're not protected. And we sat down as a bunch of engineers trying to figure out how we solve this. So the trucked land mobile systems, even though they were right, their bandwidths were this wide. The received bandwidths on those little garage door openers, which the, the transmitters only did this, but the receivers were 10 megahertz wide. <laughs> you couldn't avoid them if you wanted to. So what happened, it, became, it was an issue that got national press attention. <laughs> you know, and, and I think even though we stood up and said they weren't protected, in the local communities there was a lot of pushback against the bases. Uh, about why are you harming uh, my system that's been there forever. Um, so what's different now about sharing? Well, the systems are much more dynamic <laughs> than they have been. And so when we start talking about 3.5 gigahertz in the early discussions, well, what's going to happen when the Navy radar comes in and large swaths of that spectrum are not usable? Why aren't all those people going to complain? We're at a point now where the systems and the networks are built to operate in multiple bands, and uh, I would say not everybody <laughs> is as uh, uh, thinking ahead about building robust systems. We need to keep working on that. But the systems are built to expect interference, <laughs> and then if a particular band or frequency isn't available, they just ship elsewhere. So. In the end, it should be mostly invisible to the consumer. I mean, we, we, the data rate might get down a bit, but it goes up and down anyway, <laughs> depending on the traffic level. And so that's where we've been heading with the technologies that are built to be able to be more robust and tolerant of interference, so that we don't have, um, when systems turn on, consumers complaining to uh, Congress that they're, they're uh, getting interference in the systems. So I agree with everything else that was said. Uh, there are risks as we go forward uh, that shouldn't cause us to be shy, but rather we need to be more bold. I think enforcement is one thing. Cyber police systems across the board is a big concern <laughs> because you know that sim simple garage door opener was not connected to anything. You know, people didn't spend a lot of time trying to hack. Now you've got systems where uh, they're interconnected with the internet. Uh, they may or may not have given any more thought to uh, cyber attacks. And so as we build these more complex systems, we have to make sure that they're going to be able to uh, uh, not be vulnerable to attacks. Great. Thank you. I think Tom's been dying to say something on this. So topic. I hopefully get the back clean up. Maybe, maybe <laughs> it'll go back to Derek. I, I'm not sure. But th th just this one question alone I found is interesting. We got CTIA and Google working together. I'm going to compliment what Julie said. You have DOD and FCC working together. Next we have cats and dogs sleeping together. It's quite a bit of culture change. And culture change is really what we're talking about. I mentioned earlier military communications and readiness in the keynote speech. We talked about spectrum maneuverability and my new best friend, uh, Mr. Bill Lasher. The criticality of that culture change is that we're putting engineering up front first. Having that engineering up front first and, and as we evolve with that culture change, I see the engineering of engineering what is the possibilities for sharing before we get to a regulatory implementation. I think three and a half gigahertz for us uh, enabled a lot of opportunities. But keep in mind, we're still living in that post 9-11 world. And that post 9-11 world is very important to keep in mind because we still have critical DOD systems that are up and operating today that are, that are providing national defense of our own territory. These things are invisible to most of the nation. In three and a half gigahertz, we're defending the national soil while we're trying to come up with sharing scenarios. The complexity of this engineering has to be trusted. We have to have that trusted engineering up front first, and then when interference does happen, we need an automated and fast response to rectify the problem. Because we can't afford to live in that interference where we degrade 
the DOD's operational capabilities. But in this culture change of engineering up front first, there are many, many possibilities. The flexibility of our systems to operate, to maneuver within the EMS, I think will bring about a new and better future, and we're going to be able to do this better, better than garage door openers, which were really two independently designed systems, engineered separately, and now we can engineer things complementing each other. Any, any go backs from anyone? Okay, and that, that's actually a, that's a good lead into the next question, which is, we've been talking about right now interacting with, with U.S. assets, but our military operates worldwide, and spectrum sharing is going to be taking place in other countries as well. And now we've got issues of compatibility and interoperability, and and as Tom alluded to, potentially not the best engineered system. So I'm going to toss this one out to Preston. That you know, what are the risks for the security and operational use of our military system? You know, can we share spectrum with systems that aren't visible without compromising the security? And what happens if systems, you know, from other countries designed for a different spectrum sharing system get used here? How do we coordinate that? How do we keep that from affecting our military? So uh, maybe I'll take them from the bottom, from the bottom up. Um, I think it's important that, that national spectrum policy, particularly influenced by the military, rethink harmonization as an objective. We've, we've tried to go for spectrum harmonization increasingly difficult. If, in fact, spectrum sharing is the new norm, what we should think about is some harmonization about how spectrum sharing systems work, so that when devices roam the world, they make use of um, spectrum access systems. So in 3.5, the big innovation is that you have to ask permission before you go in the band. You have to continually get that permission. That protects the Navy. Um, if the ship comes into Norfolk, it gets sensed. We shut down devices on those channels. Um, automatically avoids interference, that's all good stuff. Just as much, that same technique could also mean that if a box bought in Japan roams into the United States, and if it's required to go and go onto one of these access systems, then it won't operate unless it's authorized by the FCC. So we actually see the methods we're using in 3.5 as starting to solve these international roaming of devices, which is a challenge without spectrum sharing. Whether the United States shares 3.5 or not, it is band 41, 42, and the rest of the world, and those boxes could very well migrate here. So this is actually a solution, not a problem. If we can get to the principle that we get rid of this. So if you are a military designer, or you are a civil guy, would you ever imagine that this is how you would work? I'm sorry to pick an ITX. <laughs> This skill serves you if you work on JTIDs. I just gave you that today. You I know, it and it's me. a great, <laughs> I've never, first time I've ever seen it. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is a train wreck. Um, and the only way to solve this is to not have people type frequencies in the boxes, but just to, to manage them like we manage everything else. None of the things we build operates independently anymore. We're all part of networks. Consumers plug stuff into the wall. We do Google Fiber, but the first people do is they make Google Fiber become a wireless access point. Everything's part of a network. So if we're gonna be part of a network, the network's the solution to this problem. Otherwise, we're gonna take two of these ones. Which one do you wanna carve in half to please somebody? That one's freeway. Okay, <laughs> carve that one in three ways. This is Solomon's baby. So, so we ought to be thinking about this. This is a way to network eye spectrum management. It's not just spectrum sharing. It's whatever you use, you get reserved, but whatever isn't used is open to people. I would argue that there's no one who needs that more than the military. You know, the military should be the first customer of the spectrum access system um, just to manage the fact that as people move around the battlefield, we do the very deconfliction dynamically the spectrum managers wish they could do, but instead they do it by going down chain of command and such. Are there security issues? Well, very clearly, uh, we won't have the same people who did healthcare.gov build it. Um, or the Democratic National Committee's website. But nevertheless, um, what we've also added is recourse. Now, I, many times I've gone out in the field and run uh, stuff and there's someone in the band and I have no recourse. I would argue you it's much 
better that there's someone there to at least have recourse. And what we've created now is a recourse. Everyone can go back. Uh, the FCC has been quite picky about what we have to do to give DOD access to shut down devices. You don't have to know who the perpetrator is. You can just go say, I'm getting interference. Shut down anyone in this channel within two kilometers of this base, and they're off. I would argue that is such a home run for anyone who uses the electromagnetic spectrum. We can solve the rest of these issues. There will be issues. But for the first time, we can solve them using the same tools as when people have overlapping IPs, policy conflicts and firewalls. Look at all the other things that happen in networks, and we live with them. Um, we will have some problems, we'll live with them, but I would argue getting rid of this. If you're selling boxes to the military and you can't sell it because the military can only give you 10 kilohertz of spectrum but they want a gigabit of data, then you want the same thing we want, which is the sharing between the military. It should be exactly the sharing out of the military. We're gonna, we are learning how to do it in civil. We have a coexistence working group, which is now that we've got this band to share with DOD, how do AT&T and Verizon share the band? Those same tools apply equally well towards how does the Army and the Air Force share a band? How does the air tasking order say, here's a pool of frequencies, you guys work it dynamically. So I think we should be thinking about this not as just DOD share with civil. It's how civil and civil share, which is a bigger problem for me now than with DOD, but it's also how does DOD move into this? DOD should be thinking about itself as sharing spectrum. And whether you're doing it with a guy like me at Google or, or Verizon, or whether you're doing it with another one of the services should be irrelevant. We all have the same problem. This is a common enemy. So before I move on to the rebuttal, you can pick up your copy <laughs> of the spectrum chart at the ITS booth across from the APG booth. for you, Keith. I wanted you to be uh, all right, does anyone want to follow up on no that? No one should be in this room who hasn't memorized this chart book. <laughs> can I borrow your chart? No. <laughs> I was, 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 was going to bat uh, close out again, but I think I'm going to borrow this chart. What, what I see, and, and stay in your seat, Paul. I see <laughs> no DOD bands here. DOD shouldn't have any bands. DOD should have all the bands, and we're that thin that thin gray line underneath all of it where DOD is nowhere but everywhere. Now, obviously we can't do that with some major systems like radar and, and other such things, but we take that and we expand it to global operations. Well, there's a certain luxury when DOD goes someplace globally. Generally, civil infrastructure has been reduced to its knees, so we're not competing with a lot of civil infrastructure unless it's a disaster relief or or a situation like that where we're trying to get an international coordination. Uh, I think uh, Preston's right. Mm -hmm. Our biggest conflict is, our, is with ourselves. We supersaturate bands because of the lack of flexibility in our own equipment design. I think as we get to sharing and we try to use some of those sharing techniques to help evolve and generate better spectrum maneuverability will only improve our own access, our ability to share, and then our ability to operate globally because we'll have that flexibility. So, no, I'm not giving up spectrum bands that are federal <laughs> yet, <laughs> but I do see a time uh, with an end state far in the future because it is an evolution that we, need to, that we need to get moving towards an end state. But I see an opportunity where we will get better and, and we'll improve across the board in that global access. Thanks. Paul, I think you're, you're jumping at the bit. To <laughs> That's all right. So, so I didn't jump out of my seat. So a couple of things, Tom, that, that you said that are important. We, as wireless carriers, while we've worked diligently with, with Julie's team to get Spectrum in the pipeline over the last couple of years, and it used to take 13 years to get Spectrum in the pipeline, Julie's done a terrific job, so I'll give you that. Without a 12 pounds? Yeah. <laughs> uh, putting a tremendous amount of new spectrum, for example, in Spectrum Frontiers, which is all the millimeter wave bands, um, you know, up for grabs so that we could deploy in that. Uh, a couple things, key things, though, that Tom said is, is, is design flexibility of the systems. One of the things that we had to learn is not all bands were created equal, not all bands were going to auction when we wanted them to, not all bands 
we had to come up with some technical solutions like carrier aggregation and other things to make those work, and we do that in LTE today. If you look at your phone, um, just think about that there's a minimum of four different bands in each of your phones, and you really don't have any idea, nor do you care as a consumer, how those are. So there's some spectrum maneuverability and flexibility that we had to figure out on the commercial side. I think we can share those lessons learned with Tom. We've pressed our manufacturers, and CTIA does represent not just the carriers, but manufacturers to work together with the carriers to make these things agile. Uh, again, because the consumer demands that. I, I think that would be well suited for the warfighter. The warfighter demands those kind of things because they have them in their commercial devices. So I think there's some lessons learned there. I think, you know, as we understand and learn through the 3.5, and you'll hear us officially call it an experiment. So sorry about that, Julie. But we're active in that, in, that experiment so that we can understand it. We can take the lessons learned from what we've stumped our toe on the commercial side, but also say, how, how do we become the right partner? How do we share what we've learned? At the same time, how do we work through the right regulatory environment that gives us investment certainty, but also does the things that Tom needs to do over time, and then figure out how to be a good neighbor. I mean, one of the things that is a success story right now for us um, is the work that we've done with Tom's team in AWS3. We have two of our large carriers that are moving into that band. But at the same time, we're coming to the table and saying, how do we work together? Which systems do we need to take down or move in a certain order? How do we not affect your mission? Because also we're trying to understand the mission of what Tom is trying to do uh, with the different systems. So I, I think there's some, as we progress in the next couple of years with this 3.5 development, I think we'll learn a lot of lessons. And I think we're beginning to really understand how to use this band and how to be a good neighbor. So, because I want to pick up on two points. One uh, Tom hit on was that you have to think globally. <laughs> um, it's not just the United States where we're dealing with the chart. That chart fits into an international map. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, the entire world has approached things with this kind of structured uh, blocks of spectrum allocation. So I'm not advocating keeping, I'm just saying that's the framework. And you have to think about too is uh, you're, you're going to operate not only in the United States but around the world and every place you go you're seeing the spectrum become more and more crowded which drives you to the point about the Tom was getting, getting at is you have to be agile because <laughs> you're going to go into environments. It's, it's much different obviously when you're dealing in a hostile environment during, as opposed to the many environments around the world where you have to operate in your, it's a friendly environment. Uh, I mean, it's not only whether you're shutting down services here in the United States, but you have to be able to work in a way that's going to be compatible around the world. So I think it's really important on that point. And I will tell you that uh, the United States really leads the world on these ideas and on spectrum, new spectrum management techniques. Uh, every time that we move forward, the rest of the world watches closely what we're doing and often you'll hear uh, some concerns raised early on and maybe some skepticism and after we've got it up and running uh, pretty quickly people line up and follow the, the same things uh, that we've been doing. So global is one point and the other I think uh, that Paul hit on is uh, the benefits of the technology. You know, we've moved from plain old cell phones to in smartphones, to the, the generations of technology that are coming will do just about anything. <clears throat> and it's there's so much worldwide investment in it and so much capability and the things it can, can do. Uh, I know that the military is looking at, well, how can I use that technology for things that you want to accomplish, still have to be secure, still have, so I'm not suggesting that we pick up smartphone and that's going to replace it, but as we look to the future, there are going to be benefits of the technology, I think, uh, not only for the private sector, but for uh, the federal side and the military as well. I'm actually going to cut this question off and move on, because this is actually the last two talks, the last two feed right into this. Um, and I want to toss this out to Paul, which, uh, given what we've just been saying, is the U.S. government doing enough to promote sharing? 
It's always nice to see Julie. It's always nice to see Derek. Uh, normally, when I, for most of you in the audience, 95% of the time that I see Julie, I'm either complaining that I don't have enough spectrum, that he hasn't written the rules to support my membership, or that some other dog has eaten my homework and I need more spectrum. Right, right, Julie? That about covers it. Yeah, that about covers it. So, you know, we're optimistic. We're seeing Julie's team release a tremendous number of bands. Again, there's uh, you've got 18 me uh, gigahertz of spectrum and that uh, has come out uh, in this last uh, further notice that we just commented on um, Monday. Uh, Julie's actually put rules down this last summer for about 11 gigahertz of spectrum. Now you'll hear me complain that he gave seven gigahertz of that to uh, unlicensed, but Preston will be happy with, with that one. But we're always wanting to work with the regulator in the right way to foster investment. If you think about it in a different way, every time we're given 10 megahertz of spectrum, after if you take just the auction proceeds away, there's billions of dollars that go on the ground in investment for every 10 megahertz that Julie allocates towards commercial spectrum. If you look at the app economy that is created with great companies like Google, et cetera, that even layers on, on top. But just the infrastructure and the systems and the jobs that we create, you know, bring that. So Julie will always hear me complain that I need more and I need it faster. Because what's happening is if you look at any chart uh, that's out there publicly available, you'll see that mobile phone growth is growing exponentially, year over year. There's some great studies out there that show you in it. And it also, depending on what you're doing, and some of the great things that uh, Preston's company and a couple of these other companies like Facebook, et cetera, they're changing the way that we act as individuals and interact, but also we're rising this app economy. If you, if you think about the app economy, it did not exist 10 years ago. So that innovation and what Julie has now opened up this last summer with Spectrum Frontiers, we're looking at the right kind of investment to be able to do that. So one of the things that we stress every time that I see Julie is making sure that we have that right regulatory framework, that we can make sure that we can foster an investment that will pass muster with investment for publicly traded companies so you can raise money, so you can deploy these systems. But also that these systems can operate in a way that, again, you're not going to the Federal Trade Commission to complain that your phone isn't working to your or to your congressman because all of a sudden, some other system came in. So we're trying to work a kind of a three-layered approach. And again, we're looking for the right fr regulatory framework. So I'm at Julie's office all the time. About, I haven't been there this week yet. So, but, but the week is new, so, so I think that's helpful. Right. Julie or Derek, which one? I think one of you need to respond to that. <laughs> um, so I... You know, I think there are challenges across the board in trying to make spectrum available. And, and often, you know, if you're on the federal side of the house or the military, it's like, well, why are they always picking on my spectrum? <laughs> we, we also, uh, I mean, we, we believe that the next generation of wireless technologies are going to need spectrum, you know, low bands, mid bands, and high bands. Uh, I don't think 5G. This is one of the few conferences I've been at that's not a 5G conference. <laughs> uh, you know, folk, folks tend to think about it, well, that's all millimeter wave, but I think it's really going to be a mix. So just to give you a sense of the, the things we're doing on other fronts uh, in, in trying to make Spectrum available, uh, we've got a TV incentive auction that's going right now. The first one in the world where the incumbent services, the broadcasters, can put their 6 megahertz up for sale be compensated for that, and then we reorganize all the remaining spectrum. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think what we're trying to do is find ways to make spectrum available across the board. Eric, do you want to add to that? Sure, and I'll just sort of, you know, piggyback on that a little bit. I mean, again, I think, I think the biggest, uh, you know, incentive, if you will, to increase spectrum sharing is, is that everyone wants additional access. Um, and as Julie, Julie mentioned, I mean, we are doing a lot. Another thing I, I would, you know, put on the table here is, you know, you know, we've worked with with DoD and all the agencies to to work on the bands that, that we currently have teed up, but we're we're not stopping there. We're looking forward. Um, we 
you know, we'll still be releasing a, a report on, on what we call the quantitative assessments of, of actual spectrum usage in, in five bands at total 960 megahertz. And in work with the agencies, what we were able to do was, was take a look at the, the frequency assignments that NTI hands out, you know, map these out, look at bands, look across the agencies and get a better sense for, okay, where may, where, where may sharing opportunities exist that we could further explore and then go into more detail, further study. So it's certainly an interim step, but yeah, I think for the, probably for the first time, we're, we're taking more of, of a detailed look there and, and to help inform our process for repurposing bands. Because I think the reality is we all know these repurposing activities that, again, will be primarily sharing opportunities. They're, they're, they're not, you know, they're not going anywhere. I think we'll keep looking and exploring these things. So and I think, again, it's very, it's very band specific. In some cases, it may be that a band looks like it's not a candidate for, for sharing either in the time domain or, or from a geographic perspective. Um, and other bands may look better, but as we dig through the analysis, it may be, okay, one system dominates a band, and let's say that system is, is, is able to be moved to another band. Now the picture looks very different. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process, but, um, and then I think the other part about sharing and incentivizing is there's, there's a flip side to it as well, too, and I know we're just sort of scratching the surface on some of these things, but I, I think there's potentially an opportunity to be more aggressive in looking at ideas on you know, opening up non, uh, federal access to non-federal bands and some creative, maybe regulatory tools there. You know, one of them that I keep thinking about is, uh, you know, a commercial licensee that, you know, wins Spectrum in an auction or holds a license and is, you know, has an impending deadline coming up for a build-out requirement. Well, what if, you know, what if they strike a deal with an agency to, you know, to let agency use, use that Spectrum either part of the time or in a geographic area, maybe that, that you know, that can count toward their build-out requirement. So I think there's, there's little steps like that that could be interesting approaches that, again, I think all of us work toward you know, maximizing spectrum use, so at the end of the day we have, we have occupancy uh, levels there. And then you know, putting in a plug for Keith and his team doing the ITS side too. I mean, a lot of their work on, on, on you know, proving measurement techniques, on studying propagation, all kind of lead down the road toward you know, maximizing how we efficiently use spectrum and how we, we create this sharing environment. Tom, I'm going to let you bat clean up on this because Preston is, is jumping up and down. He, Preston, is the government doing enough to encourage share? So, so there's no question the government's doing an unprecedented amount and is certainly leading in the world and all. That said, <laughs> one, the, the one thing that concerned me is, first of all, we're way too focused on federal spectrum sharing. And we should be talking about spectrum sharing. Um, I do see yeah, I do something for you, Tom. Um, the, the secret to, to bi-directional sharing is not federal sharing of civil spectrum. It is how do we make more sharing of civil spectrum of which the federal user would be one of those parties. I think it's a more general question and we aren't doing it. You know, we have been un, pretty uh, unapologetic that we treat 374 too as massive sharing opportunities, it's not federal, but the same rules should apply. So I think one thing that's hampered us is we have a very transactional approach to spectrum sharing. Some bands are proposed. People go and engineer the heck out of those bands. Uh, PCAS wrote two pages of recommendations. The FCC, I think, has 500 pages of report in order to, to magnify those. Um, but what we haven't done is sort of said, what are the general principles and frameworks that we can sort of think of these bands as special cases of? Instead, we're doing all the special cases. So if the, and it's not a criticism, it's but we've now learned enough that we, don't, we shouldn't be doing five more sharing cases and picking on the federal government, but should be thinking a lot more as a community, NOCOM and TS, FCC, sort of like the Yield Spectrum Policy Task Force, about, about how do we sort of go to a different principle, which is everything is shared, but people have very strong rights in those shared spectrum. Um, if you're a cellular carrier and you're deployed, Fine, you know, it doesn't have any effect on you. If your spectrum that was bought at auction and it's never been used, then why does DOD have to make even a special deal? Why can't it just go and use some of that AWS spectrum that hasn't been deployed? So I, I think we're still thinking of sharing as the exception. And if we step back a little bit and said, what if we just said it was shared with very strong rights? What are the frameworks that would allow us to move towards that and, and look to share 20 or 30 gigahertz of spectrum? Um, Otherwise, we're going to, we could be here for 30 years, band for band, engineering each one. And that's a longer career than I need. Some people in the room might need it. 
But I think it's time to take what we've learned now, generalize it, and then come back down and have to have bands argue why they shouldn't be into the framework as compared to having to make arguments of why things are in. Tom? I got your good news. <laughs> you did? Oh. It was a beautiful thing. I was very happy. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction. Uh, are we doing enough for in spectrum sharing? I'm going to say, please, Julie, slow your roll just a little bit. Paul, oh, did you have to go across the river with that? Really? Did you have to walk up the hill? Really? We're challenged in DOD uh, right now. Spectrum sharing, which we advocate very strongly for, is about trust. And we have to get the trust in place first. We have to get the sound engineering up front first to make it happen. I'm fortunate enough to be involved with ITS out at Boulder and the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, out at Boulder. We did a measurement campaign for L on LTE and GPS. And we had, why was I lucky? Because we were able to leverage all the available engineering capacity out there to help do that analysis. And one of the most impressive things was the data analysis. Because we had statisticians, highly credentialed, looking at data streams like the matrix and, and seeing errors in reporting of coming off measurements of GPS devices. And the data streams weren't in English. They weren't in any language at all. They were digits. And they were seeing errors in reading that kind of code. We're saturated right now in the engineering capacity that we can generate to work through sharing studies. I'm not saying necessarily slow the concepts, but I'm saying we need to get that engineering up front first. We need greater partnership with industry because as we've learned in the three and a half gigahertz sharing ex experiment, I'll buy into that a little bit, <laughs> that we're putting together now is industry is working hard to develop the capacity and the capabilities that we can trust within the sharing regime of three and a half gigahertz to ensure those critical national capabilities are in place. We're also working closely and seeing great change with the FCC allowing us to put that engineering up front into the rule makings that are coming forward. These are all things that are critically important, but the core is engineering. And the challenge goes to the scope of the country itself. What are we doing enough in our nation to get educated engineers at the right level that I can give security clearances to to help work through these complex problems. This is really a national level challenge of our engineering capacity. Thanks. Okay, we're running out of time here, but I'd kind of like to just toss one last question off to Julie, which is, as we get more dynamic in our sharing, what are the challenges in enforcement? How do we deal with that? And especially, how do we balance enforcement with privacy? So, enforcement has multiple connotations to it. Uh, so we're not just talking about, well, what do you do when somebody violated the rules and had helmet, you know, was overpowered and are they gonna get fined? But rather, we have confidence in the system <laughs> that, uh, when I talk to folks and they, they say, well, I'm, if I get interference, I don't want to have to wait three months <laughs> for it to be solved. And I think what Preston was hitting on earlier is you build those things into the system. So with DFS, when we had problems, and it was actually uh, the, the vast majority of it because people had taken equipment that was certified for operation on frequency bands where there was no dynamic frequency selection and they modified it to operate in bands that were used by weather bureaus. <laughs> and when the problem, you know, honestly, nobody really anticipated that at the start. And when the problem emerged, the only way we could really could deal with it effectively was by sending out our field people to DF, direction find, the source of the interference. When we got to white spaces, which, you know, as soon as we got the rules in place, we started the incentive auction, so it's still kind of sitting, uh, waiting to see what the outcome is. We added in that the database that would handshake with the devices, would have an FCC identifier of the, the device, and, and the ability, basically, to either grant permission or not. In other words, the ability to turn it off. 
We're not so naive as to think nobody could try to find a way around that, but we were trying to build in the enforcement mechanisms. And so when we get to the SAS, it's a more sophisticated system to if, if the problem emerges that through the SAS we can control these things and manage uh, the problems. So uh, I, I think when it comes to enforcement, like the last thing I'll say is that we put in place these sharing rules. Uh, well, when the ship comes in, the ESC is going to detect it and the devices are going to shut down or not have access to that space. How do you make sure that those rules, the sharing regime, are honored and, and that they work? And so we all go into this with the idea that when the engineers design things to work, you try to anticipate the problems, but you know full well, and I think we've heard this a little bit this morning, there are going to be things you didn't expect, and you just have to try to build in the mechanisms from the start that you can take care of the compliance with the sharing rules, the enforcement, the ability to turn things off. Okay, we have time for like one rebuttal. I don't want to say it's a rebuttal, but I think it's, you, sh you can contrast with trust to come back to Tom's. DFS was done with great reluctance by industry, pushback, minimalist. They saw no interest in it. There was no future in DFS working well for industry, and so they gave it short shrift. I think we believe that DOD is sincere in its desire to share spectrum. Therefore, this time, industry has a burden to make it work. I think that's one fundamental difference in the DFS experience in the 3.5. If we slow 3.5, we are cutting ourselves off from gigahertz of spectrum. It's more important to do right, whereas I think the DFS guys just wanted to get this thing done and get on and sell boxes because spectrum sharing wasn't in their future. So I think the fact that DOD has been very open that this is not a one-shotter, but this is a campaign to do together means that, that we take our responsibility for trustworthiness a lot more seriously than a box vendor selling it for 80 bucks and letting you download new software and, and write it off. So I do think, I think we view the trust issue significantly different than people did during the DFS engagement. All right, I'd like to turn it over, see if there's any questions from the audience. We've got a microphone up here. So uh, a lot of this is touched on policy and rules and regulations, and a lot that's enabled by what the technologies can do. Right? So um, I'm curious what your top technology enabler is moving forward in the next five or so years to actually make spectrum sharing a reality. And if someone chooses the one that you were going to talk on, you choose a different one. Who wants I'll to take that? Well, I'll, I'll take the shot, even though I'm not with the technology company. <laughs> uh, there's not just one. Uh, so when we start looking at 5G, first of all, the, the, the steerable beams, the antenna arrays, that's a key. The advances in MIMO is a key. Uh, I think we're seeing uh, improvements in the coding and modulation techniques. Uh, and then these whole, you know, these ideas of uh, whether we call it databases, or spectrum access systems, brand new. <laughs> Uh, and, and uh, which is not to say we apply it everywhere. <laughs> it's just I, and particularly when we started talking about the millimeter waves and people said, well, "How are you going to share all this?" Well, if I can steer the beams, I can have a lot, get a lot more reuse, and I can manage the interference by having them not aim at each other. I would say spa the spatial, we've done spatial by distance, so angular separation, and, and in 3.5 it's three-dimensional too, because buildings, the floor of building is 50 dB. Tragically, I don't think techno policy is ever enabled by technology. Unfortunately, it works the other way around. Most of our technologies follow policies, uh, and they found a way to work them, which is truly tragic. Um, but the, the purely tech one that enables all this is tunable RF filters, frankly. The, the, much of the problem has been with receivers that we can't protect, that will survive. And this whole idea of opening up broad areas of operation for radars. For, you know, we open up broad areas of operation, we give people hunting licenses for spectrum rather than assignments. And that's clearly where we want to get to. Statistically, we don't use the spectrum. 
and the way to get to that is having a lot more agility in our devices. Agile transmitter is not hard to build. Agile receiver is not hard to build. Agile analog really hard. When we do that, we give people recourse. They can have broader coverage. A lot of these issues go away. They're just artifacts of fixed frequencies, in, mostly in civil gear and in uh, radars. So uh, access in the, and use in the electromagnetic spectrum is one of the most interdisciplinary uh, s studies there are. We can get positive impact across many, many different types of science, from data compression all the way to, to tunable antennas. Uh, I think in the very, very near term, MIMO is very important. Uh, I think we're going to get a lot of mileage out of that. For, for more than a decade, I would almost say two decades, I've been very hopeful for DSA. I think we're kind of on the cusp of getting DSA to a point where it's fieldable for the Department of Defense. I think we have a few critical hurdles we have to get over, and that is how do we input uh, commander's intent sort of policy into spectrum access, and, and follow that up with uh, environmental awareness. We need in the developments in environmental awareness that can be turned into uh, radio utilization capabilities. Uh, that is a, a huge challenge for us. Right now we want to see a lot of uh, development in that regard because from an operational maneuver perspective, it's absolutely essential to trusted sharing. Having that be accurate is also a paramount. So uh, there's a, you, you pick a technology, you can pick a number one within that technology. And, and there is no one more important than the other. Any other thoughts? Any other questions from the another question for the crowd? No. Any closing remarks anyone wants to make here? Then, all right. Thank you very much for for sitting in. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs>